morning, everybody. Good morning. It's JPR, and welcome back to another video. Legendary Pokemon are debatably the most important thing for Game Freak to nail. They're everyone's first impression of the game before the game has even begun. I mean, how are you going to sell two versions if you can't sell people on two legendaries? So we should go without saying that with so much going into each of them, they also have some of the most interesting trivia in the series. Here are some cool facts about every legendary Pokemon. And hey, if this video does well, maybe I'll come back and do the mythicals later down the road. Now buckle up, because we're going fast! In all the Kanto-based games except for Let's Go, if you go to the upstairs area of the gate on Route 15, you can use the binoculars to see an Articuno flying towards the sea. More curiously, the Articuno can still be seen in the binoculars even after catching the one at the Seafoam Islands. This seemingly is the first implication that there are several of each legendary Pokémon in existence, but more than likely, it's probably just another funny Gen 1 oversight made by the developers. Articuno is also tied with Zapdos as the legendary that you can obtain with the fewest amount of badges in any game. At least, not counting gift legendaries like Kubfu. Be gone, DLC bear! And let's go Pikachu and Eevee, since partner skills aren't tied to badge progression like HMs were. After beating Brock and Misty, it's possible to catch Zapdos and Articuno both so long as you have the traversal skills unlocked. Though, you'll have to use Great Balls more than likely, since you can't buy Ultra Balls with only two badges in those titles. While the first two legendary birds are always found at the power plant and Seafoam Islands respectively, Moltres is the only one to have its location moved. Not just being found in three different areas, but three entirely different regions. In Gen 1 and Let's Go, it's found in Kanto's Victory Road. In Fire and Leaf Green, it gets moved to Mount Ember in the Sevi Islands. And in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, it gets moved to Mount Silver in the Johto region. Despite being absent from Gen 2, Mewtwo had a special item associated with it, the Berserk Gene. If you've never heard of this item, it's because it only existed in Gen 2. This gives a Pokémon an instant plus 2 attack when it enters a battle, but also permanently confuses the Pokémon as long as it's on the field. For this reason, it's generally considered a pretty bad item. The Gene can only be found legitimately as a hidden item where the former entrance to the Cerulean Cave was. However, the game is coded for Wild Mewtwo to have a 100% chance of holding the Berserk Gene. So, it's possible Mewtwo was meant to appear in Gen 2, but had to be cut due to data restrictions. As many things in Kanto did. The only other mention of the Berserk Gene in any game comes from Detective Pikachu, where it's implied to be an ingredient of the chemical R, which makes Pokémon go wild. In Pokémon Crystal, the Legendary Beast became the first Legendary Pokémon to receive their own unique battle theme. Not even Ho-Oh or Lugio get theirs until Gen 4. Speaking of the remakes in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the base would also be the first legendary Pokémon to get unique remixes of the same theme. Their battle theme also exists in Pokémon Ruby and Sapphire, but went unused. And I don't mean the original, I mean an actual GBA remix. You've been listening to it in the background of this video right now. Interestingly, these are the three main legendary Pokémon you can obtain in the main story of Pokémon Colosseum. So it's highly likely that with Colosseum being used to fill in the missing Pokémon from the National decks, the beasts were cut from the Hoenn games at the last minute. This is supported by the fact that the battle theme is completely removed from Pokémon Emerald's coding. Lugia is one of the only Pokémon not created by a member of Game Freak's staff. Instead, it was created by the original director of the Pokémon anime, Takeshi Shudo, who created Lugia for the sole reason of having a Pokémon symbolize the ocean currents in the Pokémon 2000 movie. He stated that he was incredibly surprised when he saw that his creation later became the mascot of Pokémon Silver version. Evidence of Lugia's existence in the games can only be found as far back as March 1999, where it was originally going to be an encounter at the Tin Tower, or Bell Tower where Ho-Oh appears in Gold version. This means Lugia was a relatively late addition in development, and may explain what has considerably less in-game lore than Ho-Oh does. Ho-Oh, on the other hand, was not created by the anime as many believe. Instead, it was revealed in Koro Koro Magazine in August 1996 as the mascot of what was then known as Pokémon 2, only six months after Red and Green released. This makes Ho-Oh the earliest reveal of Pokémon of all time, being revealed more than three years before Gold and Silver's release. Ho-Oh is also the only box legendary to have ever lost its signature move, as it now shares Sacred Fire with Entei as a Pokémon X and Y. Moving into Gen 3, the Reggie Trio have the most common legendary battle theme in the series, as a version of it has been played in every generation since their debut, minus Gen 9, which is still relatively new. Give it time, I'm sure they're coming. Discounting Ultra Space and other forms of wormholes or separate dimensions, the original Reggie Trio also has the most separate incarnations of all legendary Pokémon, with different versions of them being found in Hoenn, Sinnoh, Unova, and the Crown Tundra. The Eon duo of Latios and Latias are the only legendary Pokémon where the player is presented with a choice in the manner in how they catch them. In Pokémon Emerald, after the credits roll, you can choose which roaming Pokémon to chase across Hoenn from the news report by selecting whether it was red or blue. 
But unlike other branching choices, such as the Crown Tundra Steeds or the new Reggie Duo, the other is still obtainable via the Eon Ticket at Southern Island. Personally, I would choose the one that I don't want as the roaming one, but this would also mean that I actually have an Eon Ticket, which I don't. The Super Ancient Pokémon, sometimes referred to as the Weather Trio, is statistically the strongest of all legendary trios by a significant margin when counting their powered-up forms, with base stat totals of 770 and 780. Kyogre also has unique surfing and diving animations in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, and diving on Kyogre will actually allow you to bypass the underwater trainers. They probably know it's good for them. Rayquaza takes inspiration from various deities and real-world myths, but it also acts as a personification of the Earth's ozone layer, as they both serve the same purpose of protecting Earth from destructive asteroids. Just as the atmosphere protects Earth from the threats of space, so too does Rayquaza, which is why he's contractually obligated to eternally have beef with Deoxys. In the Sinnoh-based games, the player's relationship to the Light Trio is made very apparent during the story, especially Mesprit, who is from the player's hometown lake of Lake Verity. This development is actually reflected through a rather niche stat, Friendship. Unlike every other legendary Pokémon, they do not have a base Friendship stat of 35. Instead, they will have a base Friendship of 140 thanks to you previously saving them from Team Galactic. One of my favorite things about this trio is that their conveniently placed lakes at the three corners of Sinnoh aren't entirely fictional. These lakes are actually found in the same locations in real-world Hokkaido, being known as Lake Shikotsu, Lake Kusharo, and Lake Onuma. Lake Kusharo even has a small island in the middle of it, just like Lake Valor does. Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina appear in the highest number of Pokémon movies, with Dialga and Palkia appearing in four, and Giratina appearing in three. Dialga and Palkia appear in the entire Sinnoh trilogy, as well as Hoopa and the Clash of Ages. Since Dialga has a more prominent role in Giratina the Sky Warrior, it actually has the highest amount of screen time of all legendary Pokémon to date. Giratina also shares its anime cry with the legendary kaiju Mothra, which has since been modified and reused for various other legendary Pokémon. Heatran is the only legendary Pokémon whose hidden ability is completely unattainable without the usage of an ability patch. It's also the only legendary Pokémon that has a 50-50 gender ratio, and one of only three that can be either gender, with Kubfu and Urshifu being the other two. Cresselia is the only legendary Pokémon whose two signature moves were introduced in two different generations, as it had Lunar Dance in Gen 4 and obtained Lunar Blessing in Gen 8. Although Cresselia is not officially available in Scarlet and Violet yet, it finally has access to both of these moves simultaneously in Gen 9. Being able to be caught at level 1 in Snowpoint Temple and level 100 in the Crown Tundra, Regigigas is tied with Magikarp and Gyarados for the largest possible wild Pokémon level gap. Regigigas also has remarkably more in common with Slacking than it does with any of the other Regis. They're both mono-normal types, both have the same base stat total of 670, the same attack stat of 160, and infamous abilities that nerf them in battle. With the introduction of the new Paradox Pokémon, Walking Wake and Iron Leaves, many people have begun drawing parallels between the Beast Trio and the Sword Trio. But oddly enough, they actually had the exact same heights for years beforehand. Cobalion and Entei are both 6'11", Terrakion and Raikou are both 6'3", and perhaps the most interesting, Verizon and Suicune are both 6'7". So if more Paradox Pokémon get released in the future, we may already know who the last two pairs will be. The Swords of Justice are also among the last Pokémon designed by Takeo Uno, who also designed many classic Pokémon including Arceus, Infernape, Garchomp, and the... Unova... monkeys. Hey, every artist has a rough patch. Ever since the removal of Mega Evolution, the forces of nature are now the only legendary trio that can change form at will. Oh, pardon, Legendary Quartet, I almost forgot. Or, rather, I'd like to forget. During development of Pokémon Black and White, it was noted that Tornadus and Thunderous used to be colored red and blue for more contrast. But the design team thought they clashed too much with Sock and Throw, who were also more demon-like designs at the time. So, as a result, both duos were changed. Landorus was also a late addition in development, so this group of four was originally only going to be a group of two. Speaking of Black and White's early development, Zekrom and Rushram's designs were originally drafted by Keiko Moritsugu, before they were handed off to Ken Sugimori to be finalized. Sugimori quickly grew fond of Zekrom, considering it his favorite Gen 5 Pokémon, and as a result, he didn't change much of the design. Rushram, on the other hand, he drastically redesigned to be more elegant and ladylike, making a more sharp contrast to Zekrom's masculine design. It's unknown what Beta Rushram truly looked like, but apparently it's far from what we have today. Kyurem has the most cries of all Pokémon, with a grand total of five. His base cry, his cries for the two fusion forms, and two longer versions of the fusion forms that only play when the game is in stereo mode. 
Black Hiram and White Hiram's overdrive modes when they attack are not recognized as official forms, though. However, our next Pokémon, Xerneas, does have two officially recognized forms. Active Mode and Neutral Mode. Basically, it just turns the lights off when it's not battling. It's always good to be energy conscious. Because of this, though, Xerneas is the only Pokémon in Sword and Shield who can't attack the Poké Toy when you wave it in its face in Pokémon Camp, as its Neutral Mode has no attacking animations. Despite being the embodiment of destruction and its name, Eveltal is not an inherently evil Pokémon. It's shown in both the anime and games that when Eveltal is calm, it poses no direct threat to people or Pokémon. It appears to mostly be a morally neutral Pokémon that simply exists to continue the natural cycle of life and death. Except in Mystery Dungeon, it's just evil. Funnily enough, both Mystery Dungeon and the 17th movie opt to have Eveltal turn people and Pokémon to stone rather than outright kill them. Probably as a way of skirting around anything too dark or sensitive. Zygarde's signature moves that were not legitimately available until Gen 7, Thousand Waves, and Thousand Arrows were both present in the coding of Pokémon X and Y, strengthening the idea that a third Kalos game centered around Zygarde was originally planned to happen. Knowing that there actually was a plan for another pair of games, it's likely that they may have been intended as version-exclusive attacks. And despite Zygarde having three forms visually, in the game's internal code, it's treated as a Pokémon with five. This is because 10% and 50% Zygarde are divided based on whether they have Aura Break or Power Construct. This is to prevent people from using Ability Pills or Ability Patches to bypass the intended way of getting Power Construct. Hey there, just wanted to say that we're less than 10,000 subscribers away from the big 200k. So every subscriber counts, even if you're just one person, it would really make my day if you subscribed and liked the video real quick. Type Null was the first legendary Pokémon given away as a gift, as Gladion gives it away in the Alola region games, and a Macro Cosmos worker gives it away in Sword and Shield. It was also the first Pokémon ever where its Spanish and Italian names differed from its English name, probably because unlike most Pokémon, its name is just two actual English words. It is the only non-paradox Pokémon with this distinction. In both Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, and Sword and Shield, Silvalli is programmed to learn all three of the Pledge moves, Grass Pledge, Fire Pledge, and Water Pledge. But for whatever reason, the coding only allows for it to learn Grass Pledge when you talk to the Move Tutor. At this point, I honestly have to wonder if Game Freak even knows that this is an issue. For the Island Guardians, I've referenced this fact in past videos, but it's probably still the most interesting fact about them, so I'll say it again. Their designs are all direct references to the official colors of the real Hawaiian Islands. Yellow, pink, red, and purple. In fact, in Hawaiian, the names of the four islands literally mean Yellow Island, Pink Island, Red Island, and Purple Island. Tapu Koko and Tapu Lele take their typings directly from the island colors, while Tapu Bulu and Tapu Fini take their typings from the God of Agriculture and God of the Sea in Hawaiian mythology. Cosmog and Cosmoem are the only two Pokémon in existence that cannot be taught any attacking moves. Cosmog is also tied for the title of lightest Pokémon in existence, while Cosmoem is the heaviest Pokémon in existence, despite being a mere four inches long, also making it the smallest Pokémon, tied with several others at least. Cosmoem has nearly a 1 million percent increase in weight from Cosmog, but also weightlessly floats around. Its extreme density is a reference to neutron stars, which is the most dense objects in the solar system. Well, aside from black holes, but that's an entirely different hole to jump through. <laughs> the red shinies of Solgaleo and Lunala are references themselves. Solgaleo's shiny form represents the sun turning into a red giant at the end of its lifespan, while Lunala's shiny form represents a lunar eclipse. In Ultra Sun or Ultra Moon, Necrozma has a catch rate of 255, which makes it the easiest possible Pokémon to catch, on the same level as many Route 1 Pokémon. This is because you just defeated its Ultra Form, so even at full health, it's still incredibly weak. This is even reflected by its in-game stats, where Necrozma's base stat total of 600 is significantly lower than the usual 680 used for most game mascots. Necrozma's status as an Ultra Beast also varies across different forms of media. In the Core Series games, Necrozma is not considered an Ultra Beast by the Aether Foundation, nor the Ultra Recon Squad. It's also resistant to Beast Balls, similar to Solgaleo and Lunala. But in the anime and manga, Necrozma is considered an Ultra Beast, and it even gets its own codename, UB Black. In the English, Chinese, and Japanese versions of Pokémon Sword and Shield, Zamazenta and Zacian are referred to as brother and sister by the Pokédex, despite being genderless species. However, other languages of the game use more gender-neutral terms to describe their relationship. Eternatus is the only legendary Pokémon in the series that is a truly unfailable catch. If you have no Pokéballs, the game literally gives you one. And the game makes sure to not give you access to the 30-second box until after you've caught Eternatus, 
so even if you filled all of your boxes, you can still catch it. And due to Eternamax Eternatus' monumental base stat total of 1125, and its defense and special defense stats of 250, if you could actually use this form at level 100, its defensive stats would break the stat limit of 655 resetting them to zero, an odd coding quirk that is exclusive to Sword and Shield. Kubfu and Urshifu are not actually from the Isle of Armor according to the Pokedex. However, their data exists in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet already, so it's possible their true home may be in the new region of Kitakami from the Teal Mask DLC. Given their inspirations, it would make sense for them to be from an Asian-inspired region, but we'll have to wait and see. Regieleki and Regidrago were the only two newly introduced legendary Pokemon in Gen 8 who were not shiny locked upon their introduction. That's all I got, sorry. Calyrex is the only Pokemon that does not draw from the remnants of Eternatus' energy to Dynamax. Instead, it Dynamax is using its own energy, which shows as a special blue aura. It can also share this power with Spectrier and Glacier when riding on their backs. Enamorous is the only legendary Pokemon to ever end a generation's national Pokedex list. Every other generation is concluded by a mythical Pokemon instead. The Treasures of Ruin are currently the only Pokemon to have ever had their stats changed by a patch made to the game. They are likely based on the Four Perils of Chinese Mythology, but the one with the coolest inspiration, at least in my opinion, is actually Wochian, who is partly inspired by a Chinese phrase about how its sins are so innumerable that all the bamboo in the world would not make enough tablets to record them all. Koridon and Moridon may be the only Paradox Pokémon with seemingly normal names, but according to the Pokédex they did have code names in the past. Winged King and Iron Serpent. And for the newest revealed but unreleased legendary Pokémon, we have Ogre Pond and Terrapagos. Ogre Pond is evidently based on a creature from Japanese folklore known as an Oni. Basically, they are just very evil demons. Terrapagos, on the other hand, is likely another reference to the mythical world Turtle, the same legend that Torterra draws inspiration from. Its name, however, draws from the Galapagos Islands, where Charles Darwin first observed animals of the same species with different adaptations. This may serve as a mirror to its terrestrialization abilities, which allow it to adapt to any situation in battle. There, you just got an A-plus in your next biology test. You're welcome. If you want to learn more about the real-world origins of legendary Pokémon, you can check out this video that I uploaded last year. And for more cool Pokémon facts, be sure to subscribe so you'll always be in the loop for my new videos. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next time.